We saw the great muzzle flash as one of the guns was fired. I remember seeing the upturned faces of the gunners as they looked for a hit. Where the hell the shell ended up, I don't know. We were past the point of no return, and all that seemed to matter was that we should destroy them. And then we were within range. The Corsair shuddered as the six guns hammered away with their deep thud. Chunks flew off the gun mountings and bodies were hurled to the back of the gun emplacements. Then we were flattening out, our wingtips throwing off great streamers of vapour as we flashed over the gun position at thirty or forty feet and out to sea. We had carried out our mission, but as the big ships were still busy, it seemed a pity to go back. I looked around for something else to hit, and suddenly remembered a fat merchantman of two to three thousand tons, apparently anchored in the middle of the harbour. It seemed to have escaped damage from the bombardment. We reformed quickly, and dived down again in line astern, firing with armour-piercing bullets at the ship's waterline. We had long been assured that a close pattern of 0.5-inch ammunition could tear up the deck of a destroyer, so a cargo ship's hull should be vulnerable enough. Our attack must have perforated her at least, for she lost no time in getting underway and heading for a key, to avoid foundering, I hoped. And then it was time to go. The bombardment had lasted twenty minutes. Even the destroyers had enjoyed a field day, for some of them had come up to the harbour entrance to discharge their torpedoes at the wharves and jetties. This time the Japanese were well and truly nettled. We had been back on board only a short time before they showed themselves in the vicinity of the fleet, and our standing patrols became busily engaged. Keith Monock's flight shot down a Sally and Bud Sutton, 1830s senior pilot, collected a Zeke. We had no luck. Two minutes after we had landed on, after an afternoon patrol, more enemy aircraft appeared and attacked the fleet. They paid dearly for their temerity. Both squadrons of the ship and a flight from Victorious ran up scores, with three Zeeks destroyed and two more damaged. Less Retalic of 1830 Squadron was our only casualty. From a height of 10,000 feet he was conscientiously photographing the target area with his large vertical camera when he took a burst of heavy flak. There was an explosion in the centre of the fuselage which set the aircraft on fire and rattled up the protective sheet of armour plating behind his seat with such force as to pepper his shoulders with fragments. He lost no time in making a classic bailout, this immediately over the airfield which gave him considerable food for thought. Such wind as there was, however, very decently carried him out to sea. He survived two hours in the water, during which he was most unsportingly potted at by Japanese shore batteries, before being safely picked up by a whaler from Nigeria, one of whose officers had carefully pinpointed the position of Les's entry into the Indian Ocean, and had set afoot plans to rescue him as soon as the ship had finished plastering Sabang with her six-inch guns. Les duly rejoined us on our return to China Bay, where Willie McGregor, our PMO, got in some practice in extracting the steel splinters from his back. As I said to him later, hardly the sort of thing that a South London schoolmaster should have to endure on a Tuesday morning. Thanks to a meeting aboard our ship with an ebullient character called Farnfield, an RN lieutenant commander, I was invited to spend a couple of days at sea in his destroyer quality. It was a refreshing change from big ship life. In company with two other destroyers, we practised a number of evolutions, including a high-speed run which thrilled me beyond belief. Destroyers are all engines and weapons, and her fantastic acceleration as she quickly worked up to about 35 knots, the vibration beneath one's feet from the mighty turbines under the iron deck, and the mountainous cliff of water which built up astern as she lifted her bows, dug in her stern and slid across the tranquil sea, left me speechless. Farnfield, clad in cap, white shorts and gym shoes, slapped his expansive tummy with glee as he revelled in my astonishment at his darling's paces. He was a destroyer man through and through. On the second afternoon, the three of us hunted one of our own submarines who delayed her departure on patrol sufficiently long to participate in our exercises for a couple of hours. She submerged as she left China Bay in the morning, and after lunch we set about finding her. Eventually Quality and another destroyer got cross-bearings on her, and, in accordance with arrangements made earlier, Farnfield ordered a hand grenade to be dropped over the mark. 
We stood by, awaiting the appearance of a small marker buoy which the submarine should send up on being detected. Nothing happened. Farnfield again took the destroyer over the mark and dropped another grenade. This one, too, produced no response. He's got his bloody head down. Turning to his first lieutenant, he said, Let's rouse the lazy bugger. Give him a depth charge on a deep setting. We went round into a great circle, building up to a breathtaking speed. As we did so, a depth charge was being prepared on the launching rails down aft. As we crossed the mark again, down went the charge. In a few seconds the muffled detonation came to our ears, the surface of the water astern of us shivered, then erupted into a great explosive cascade of water. Once more we stood by. In about three minutes the submarine's nose slowly emerged. She surfaced fully and her signalling lamp went into action, a damned sight too fast for me to read. What does he say? Thank you for awakening me. I was enjoying my Sunday afternoon. There were times when we considered that the heat was a greater worry to us than the thought of battling with the enemy. It seemed to be something to which we couldn't adjust ourselves. British ships of that generation weren't designed for those latitudes, and, in the absence of any form of air conditioning, even the shortest possible time spent in an enclosed space could be purgatory. Our life in Ceylon and the Indian Ocean was certainly subjected to the onslaughts of this oppressive heat. It affected tempers and efficiency, and a great deal of understanding was necessary to maintain morale. Certainly a great deal of imagination, which King's regulations and Admiralty instructions didn't cater for. What with cricket and football matches, deck hockey leagues, darts matches on the mess decks, lectures, discussion groups and gramophone recitals, we managed to keep the boys happy enough, and our adjutant, Steve Starkey, was indefatigable in his efforts to keep their minds and bodies in good trim. In those latitudes, morale is everything, and all his efforts had that as their goal. Entertainment of a more exciting nature was always being provided in some form or other. I was in the hangar about 1600 one afternoon, when a messenger summoned me to see the commander in the wardroom. You have a young man called Domain in your squadron hands. What is he? Electrician, sir. A good boy. Yes, I'm sure. He wants my permission to dive from the Admiral's bridge. He grinned at my expression. And well he might. Good God! What height was that? Hell! It was eighty to ninety feet. But the commander was carrying on. He's your man. Provided you have no objections, it has my blessing. He paused for a moment. He obviously has every confidence in his own ability, and I don't like battening down on a good man. I went up to the flight deck. A fair gate had gathered from which rose a hum of anticipation and excitement. I ran up the ladders to the Admiral's bridge. De Man was standing on the outer rim of the deck, only his hands on the upper rail preventing him from falling into China Bay. There was a sea of upturned faces beneath him, their owners clinging to every possible projection from the starboard side of the deck and ship. Domain grinned at me as I walked over to him. Tired of the food, Domain, or are you having electrical trouble? The lads want me to have a go, sir. I can do it all right if you say it's OK. Off you go, then. He braced himself for a couple of seconds, then he was off. He sprang out away from the ship in a great arc, his body arching as he fell away from me at an incredible speed. He straightened out to a knife blade an instant before he hit the sea, his clenched fists battering a hole into the water. There was only a plop, no splash, as he sliced into the water. Magnificent. A burst of cheering greeted him as he surfaced. It came from other ships nearby too, in addition to our own. He crawled quickly to the starboard brow and met me at the door from the flight deck to the island. The lads want an encore, sir, he gasped, his great chest heaving from his exertions. I'll bet they do. Jack, you were great. I didn't know we had a star on the strength. But no more, old son, and don't take any notice of them. Believe it or not, the same crowd watch deck landings and you can take it from me that a fair percentage of them are hoping you'll break your bloody neck. Be happy with one. You're too good a lad to risk your life again. One of the benefits emanating from a happy ship or squadron was the remarkable absence of trouble among officers and ratings alike. 
Naturally, there were occasions when their halos tilted a little, but only one serious incident comes back to me. Since the squadron's days at Stretton, almost a year earlier, we had been bedeviled by petty thieving in the ratings quarters, and some of it was quite serious. Petty Officer Turner and I had spent a lot of time and effort trying to apprehend the culprit, but without success. Most crimes rear their ugly heads at some time or other in the Navy, as in any other organisation where men in large numbers are gathered together. The great majority of them are dealt with in a calm, gentlemanly manner, with neither rancour nor hard feelings. Drunkenness, setting fire to bunks or hammocks whilst in a drunken stupor, absence without leave, striking a superior officer, all these are taken in the Navy's stride. But theft is something the Navy finds impossible to forgive. There is no privacy in a ship, no lockable drawers or cupboards, no private safes. If one cannot trust one's messmates, life is not worth living and the stability of the system falters. Eventually this lad was caught. Another rating, living ashore at Trincomalee and suffering from a mild attack of sunstroke, was confined to his bed. Resting in his bunk behind his mosquito net one afternoon, he saw the culprit systematically rifling through his messmate's gear. He leapt from his bed and grappled with the thief, who pitched out of an open window a wristwatch he had just found. Later, I was asked by the commander to read the warrant which would commit the rating to detention. The fatal document in hand, I went up to the hangar deck. There, on the lift, was the squadron drawn up in a hollow square, officers lined up facing the ratings. I took my place in front of them and read out the sentence. I was halfway through when the prisoner started to sob as the solemnity of the occasion overwhelmed him. With an unbelievable effort, I managed to keep my voice steady. Some of the ratings began to shuffle with embarrassment, to be stopped in their tracks by a rasping censure from Turner. The Marines marched him away to his weeks of hell upon earth. I felt as though I were about to serve his sentence for him. When in harbour we had, of course, the cinema. On board, our Odeon was situated in the well of the after-aircraft lift, the screen suspended on its forward bulkhead, with the projector shining from the after-bulkhead. If we were lucky enough to be in harbour on a Sunday, this was officers' night at the movies. Naturally enough, the quality of the films, both in content and physical condition, varied. What never varied was the quality of the wisecracks from the audiences. Film stars of the time would quickly have acquired inferiority complexes had they known that, despite their best endeavours, every film became a farce. Any ratings who had missed a film during the week would catch it on Sunday when, since the officers occupied the stalls on the lowered lift itself, they would sit on the flight deck, legs dangling into the lift well, looking down from the gods. Their ribald comments on any film were worth a king's ransom, and were even more hilariously lurid whenever tragedy or high drama appeared on the screen. Detectives were loudly informed of the doings of their suspects, five minutes ahead of schedule. Lovesick swains vowing undying love were vociferously advised. You want to leave that bit alone, mate? She's been in the stoker's mess all weekend. Add it from here to there, she's... Movie tone newsreels probably took the biggest beating of all. Their commentators, no doubt in a laudable endeavour to boost civilian morale during those depressing middle years of the war, were inclined to turn every slight advantage gained in the field into a major victory, and every reverse into a temporary and trivial setback. There was much talk of our brave lads with their tails well up. This was enough to send our matelots into paroxysms of Rabelaisian ecstasy, from which the much maligned pongos emerged none too well. When 1,800 of you are obliged to live together in a big iron box, you have to try, don't you? Perhaps more so in harbour than at sea, the wardroom could burst into song at the drop of a hat. Sometimes after supper, around 2100, there would be a suggestion that the piano should be brought across. Manhandling quickly moved it from the dining mess across the passage into the wardroom, and in a matter of seconds the sing-song was underway. Most of our songs were sung with everybody word perfect as they roared out the full-blooded choruses, and there was no shortage of soloists, each of whom had a verse or two of his own pet ditty to contribute. We were lucky to have as shipmates the well-known actors Michael Horden, Robert Edison and Douglas Storm. 
One of our company for six months or so was the BBC producer Malcolm Baker-Smith, who was collecting material for a projected film on the subject of life aboard carriers. These indispensable shipmates not only joined in the singing with professional gusto, but were, from their calling, clever enough to write new and topical material for us to sing. More than that, they would stage one-act plays at short notice, write pantomimes and contribute in every way to the wonderful spirit that abounded in the wardroom. Standing around a piano, singing songs, drinking, with perspiration streaming down one's face and dripping from the chin, might well fail to appeal to modern young men as a relaxation. To us, it was a lifesaver. To be with good and true friends, indulging in harmless, uproarious fun, was something which enabled us to relax completely from the nervous tension of our jobs, to survive the absence of our nearest and dearest, and to recover from the shock and grief caused by the loss of our comrades in arms. As a change from pounding out accompaniments to nautical ditties, fun though they may be, it was refreshing to be called upon to play more serious music. We had a fair sprinkling of messmates who found peace and tranquillity in sitting round the piano in the quiet of the dining mess when Bob Finley or I played snatches of Beethoven or Dvorak, Schubert or Tchaikovsky. Steve Starkey gave talks on musical appreciation to our squadron ratings and would ask Bob or myself to play bits and pieces to illustrate them. When darkness fell soon after 6pm, the evenings were long, and our faithful chapel upright was nothing short of a godsend. A promise of relief from the dubious joys of life in Ceylon flickered when a rumour spread that the ship's boilers were in need of major refit, and that it would be necessary to go to South Africa for the job to be carried out. Strangely enough, the fighter boys didn't exactly roll around the deck in ecstasy. In fact, Mike Tritton suggested to the captain that we might be temporarily seconded to the RAF on the Burma front if the ship was to be off station for any length of time. We felt that concentrated operations up in the north would give us invaluable experience. Eventually, the answer had to be no. The problems of transporting squadrons and stores and of maintaining steady supplies of spares for our aircraft when we got there would be insuperable. We had to settle for South Africa. Perhaps, after all, a change from the sweaty, primitive charms of Trincomalee would do us no harm at all. We sailed for South Africa on July 30th, leaving behind us at China Bay Jimmy Clark, Matt Barber, Ken Seebeck and Neil Brynildsen, all of whom were returning to New Zealand for leave. I myself was looking forward to a few weeks in a more temperate climate. Prickly heat was knocking hell out of me, and it seemed that my tummy was occupied for most of its time in doing slow rolls. Eventually, after brief calls at Adu Atoll and Diego Suarez, we arrived in Durban on August 9th. We tied up alongside, refuelled, and were away again by 1600. We were obviously in a hurry. The weather now showed us what the Roaring Forties could do. Never had I seen such great seas or such an awesome swell. Despite the height of the flight deck above water level, we were taking it green and some of the aircraft parked on deck suffered heavy punishment. Great fun, though. Two days later, off Cape Agulhas, the entire air group took off and flew to the naval air station at Wingfield, a few miles out of Cape Town. We were too large a force to be accommodated at Durban, so here we were for the next two to three months. Having disembarked our ratings, unloaded our spares and personal gear and made her farewells, Illustrious returned forthwith to Durban to get on with her boiler refit. The first thing was leave. Within three days of our arrival, thanks to the magnificent and entirely unselfish work put in by the South African Women's Voluntary Service, all our ratings had been dispatched on a fortnight's holiday, with all travelling expenses, accommodation and maintenance free, and air crews on a longer leave of three weeks. South Africa welcomed us with open arms, and her hospitality, already world famous, knew no bounds. Fanny Ford, our Barracuda wing leader, had been there at some time earlier in the war, and had an open invitation to stay with a family in Johannesburg. What was more, the invitation included a friend. He asked me to join him in spending our leave there, and a telephone call fixed it up. We spent 36 hours on the famous blue train, 
rising out of the cape to the great Karoo and steaming hour after hour across the wide, boundless veldt. During that wonderful train journey, I saw for the first time wild ostriches speeding across the flat, featureless landscape with their amazingly fast trot. At 8.30 in the morning of the third day, we pulled into the main railway station of the City of Gold. For three happy weeks, we lived the life of princes at the home of Eric and Kay Gallo, whose lovely house out at Sandhurst was laid wide open for our enjoyment. They were the finest of hosts. Never for one moment did they try to organise us, but whatever we wished was simply provided without a second thought. We had a wonderful time. There were plenty of the lads spending their leave in Joburg. We ran into them in bars, in restaurants and in night spots. One afternoon I ran into Gus, quietly sinking a few beers. That was a lovely girl I saw you with last night at the Stardust. Where on earth did you gather up sufficient influence to meet her? St. Shea Pippin, Hans. Talk about a lovely face. Did you ever see anything like it? And what about her figure? Legs too. Haven't seen anything like it for years. He paused to put away the bottom half of his glass of beer. I ran into Mick Ritchie in a nightclub where we had gone with Eric and Kay. Mick was red-faced from the pressure being applied to his abdomen and chest by the arms of a beautiful wren who wasn't the least bit ashamed to be seen making powerful advances to a great seduction. When the moment offered itself, I told Mick that I feared for his safety. But by God, Mick, she's a lovely girl. Yes, as a matter of fact, I met her at a private party an evening or two ago. She was with a big Pongo captain then. Now I find her here with a couple of girls. I thought I'd better find out the score before going into action, so I asked her where the field marshal was. Oh, him, says she. He's gone back to his unit. You know how it is. The king is dead. Long live the king. Three weeks of hectic living passed all too quickly. It was a sad moment for me when I leaned out of the carriage window of the famous blue train to wave goodbye. We had enjoyed a never-to-be-forgotten holiday whose happy memories took a long, long time to fade. Life on the air station at Wingfield was luxurious after the confines of the ship and the primitive life ashore at China Bay. The sight of fresh fruit and vegetables, jugs of milk at every meal, unlimited butter, bread with not a trace of a weevil, all these appeared in endless profusion. South Africa, it seemed, was a bottomless cornucopia, and there was news. Terence Shaw, our operations commander, had left the ship to the sorrow of every officer in the mess. He had been replaced by John Smallwood, who had decided to come to Wingfield to make our acquaintance rather than await our return to the ship. There was excitement for the squadrons too. Our pilot complements were now to be increased to 20, with 18 aircraft, and as a result of the disbanding of 1838 Squadron, eight new boys now joined us. John Wong Lee a tall, good-looking lad from London, Ron Ayrton, a young man from Essex, Jimmy James, tall and cheerful, who enhanced the squadron considerably by virtue of his straight stripes, Jerry Morgan, a Canadian from Montreal, and four New Zealanders, Evan Baxter, Ben Heffer, Jack Parley, and Adrian, Winnie, Churchill. Jack Parley and Winnie Churchill were highly experienced pilots and tough, hard-boiled characters. They were an asset to any fighting unit and were old enough and sufficiently stable to be good leaders. I had no hesitation in making them flight commanders. In view of the increased size of the squadron, I now decided that we could stand two senior pilots and I accordingly appointed Jack Parley to work alongside Keith Munnock. I couldn't have done better. Life, however, wasn't all beer and skittles. Minor troubles had to be attended to. When the ship was nearing South Africa, commanding officers of all squadrons had been given two memoranda to be read out loud and clear to their assembled units. The first one related to our general behaviour whilst in the Union. Apartheid was pretty hot stuff at that time, and, to put it in a nutshell, we were warned that association with the black population would bring down coals of fire on our heads from the community. The captain punished them by denying them shore leave for the rest of their stay at Wingfield. A few days later they were in deeper trouble when it was found that their escapade had left them with a legacy of gonorrhea. They paid dearly for their defiance in the face of express orders. 
the other Admiralty Fleet Order promulgated at the same time concerned aircraft. The two main landing wheels of the Corsair were made of aluminum alloy and carried large tyres inflated to a pressure of 120 pounds per square inch. To inflate these, our ratings used compressed air bottles of a pressure of 1,300 psi, not the sort of thing for children to play with. One rating, I think victorious, in recent weeks had inflated a tyre and had elected to guess its pressure rather than go to the trouble of fetching a pressure gauge. In fact, he had inflated the tyre to such a pressure that the wheel had broken in two under the strain. Half of it flew straight for his abdomen, cutting him neatly into two portions. Not surprisingly, he was very dead before he knew what had hit him. So the gypsy's warning went out. Don't blow up tyres without having a pressure gauge in hand. Some days after our return from leave, I was poking my nose around our hangar and the concrete apron surrounding it, where mechanics were servicing aircraft in the brilliant sunshine. As I ambled up to one of the aircraft, I saw a rigger on the point of wheeling away a light trolley carrying an air bottle. As he left the Corsair, he kicked the tyre perfunctorily with the toe of his large navy boot. He looked up and wished me good morning. To be fair, it must be said that the great majority of the maintenance ratings did a fine, honest job, usually under very trying circumstances. The fact that so many of us survived is a great tribute to their skill and devotion to their jobs. Not long after the new intake of pilots had joined us, I was looking through my office window when I saw Jerry Morgan leading out a flight for takeoff. Jerry, a Lieutenant RCNVR, was a short, slim lad who had already created an impression of being somewhat on the cocky side. He had been heard to say that he could fly the crates they come in, a typical fighter boy's line-shooting comment, to be sure. But, taken in conjunction with his short stature, we had put two and two together. So I was interested to see how he shaped as a pilot. As flight commander, he took off first, and in a manner too nearly suicidal for comfort. He held down the nose long after gaining flying speed, raised the undercarriage and took off in a screaming turn to port with the wingtip no more than a foot or two from the grass until he reached the perimeter when he pulled up, still in a sharp turn. It should perhaps be explained that piston-engined aircraft of those far-off days had a nasty, if rare, habit of cutting out on takeoff, a crucial time in any flight. To be honest, I never heard of this happening to a Corsair. This could happen if the engine had not been thoroughly warmed up before takeoff, if water or moisture had got at the petrol, or if there was a sudden failure of the ignition system. There could be many reasons. Graveyards near airfields contain the bones of many a pilot whose engine has died on takeoff, for generally this means death. Many pilots have attempted to glide back to the airfield, but few, if any, have ever made it. The one hope of survival is to hold a straight course and ease her into the ground. If you're heading for a race course, a golf course, a lake, or even a stretch of motorway, you'll live. On the other hand, if the nose is pointing inevitably at the Albert Hall, the centre of Wakefield or Winchester Cathedral, you're a dead duck. This is why a pupil under training is taught to climb straight out of a field and turn only when he has sufficient height to give him room to manoeuvre should the worst happen. Morgan's takeoff was contrary to all the laws of survival. I told him so in no uncertain terms when he landed. There was no particular objection to suicide, I said, but to put at risk the lives of innocent people working in the admin buildings which he had only just scraped over on his takeoff was unforgivable. So, don't bloody well do it again! True to form, he chose to ignore the warning, and two days later he imitated his first effort possibly even more spectacularly. Who he was trying to impress, I don't know. His squadron chums, the Rennery, or himself. I ran to my aircraft and called him up on the RT. When I ordered him peremptorily to land, he started to argue. Cutting him short, I told him that if he uttered one more word, I would come up and bloody well shoot him down. Shades of Eric Monk. Ten minutes later, he landed. I grabbed him by the arm and dragged him into the office. Full of protests and indignation, he pushed his lieutenant's stripes at me. This I ignored and grounded him for a fortnight. This hurt him, for he loved flying as much as the rest of us. When he chose to remonstrate, I added insult to injury by committing him to be duty boy for the same period. This certainly went in deeply, 
for he was very conscious of his rank. He stormed out, hating my guts. As he closed the door, I muttered to myself, Now that should stop you, my boy. But it didn't. One night during the week following our return from leave, eight of us emerged from a film in Cape Town about 10.30pm, ready for something to eat. We were a voracious lot and ready to tackle any of the marvellous food which South Africa put before us. I spoke to a policeman on his beat and he suggested a nightclub just round the corner. It was a comfortable spot. Nothing pretentious, but chummy and inviting. A few couples were dancing to a seven-piece band under subdued lighting. The waiter suggested ham sandwiches and beer, which appealed to all present. Later, when presented with the bill, my hair stood on end. Food and drink were cheap in the union, but even allowing for the usual stick-on encountered in any nightclub, this was ridiculous. I handed it silently to Jack Parley, who was sitting beside me. Jack was a large young man, of average height but thick set and all muscle. He had shoulders like Joe Lewis. He whistled under his raised eyebrows. Christ, boss, you're surely not paying that. I assured him that I had no intention of doing so. I would see the manager. Jack asked if he could accompany me. The manager was a large, unhealthy-looking mountain of flabby flesh who didn't impress us at all. He bore the look of a man who spent all his life indoors and who slept at the wrong end of the day. I showed him the bill and told him what we had consumed. Without any aggression, I assured him that I had no intention of paying it in its present state. He shrugged his shoulders. You pay it or I call the cops. So I tried gentle blackmail. There was over one hundred of us out at Wingfield, many of whom would be finding girlfriends and would need somewhere for food and drink. If he were reasonable and played ball with us, he would make a bomb, but he didn't see it my way. Pay or else, Jack spoke up. Mind if I say a word, boss? I told him to go ahead. It's like this. What the boss really means, though you don't see it, is this. Alter the bill now, or call in the decorators first thing in the morning. The bill was halved before our very eyes. Marvellous. I hadn't realised what great psychologists New Zealanders were. The manager never regretted it. He made his fortune out of us. The Union of South Africa had contributed magnificently to the funds of the Navy League and was still doing so at the time of our visit. The captain suggested that we might put on an air day for the inhabitants of Cape Town and that an admission charge would raise quite a stack as donations to the League's funds. Fanny, Michael and I got down to it. The bombers put on a show over the airfield, the fighters carried out some aerobatics, singly and in formation. Our aircraft were on view, and officers and ratings were on hand to explain things and to answer questions. Finally, we rounded off the afternoon with a simulated strike on the airfield. We arranged that the Barracuda's attack would be prefaced by a ground strafe by 16 Corsairs. Churchill, Cole, Sutton and I would lead four flights of four in quick succession across the field, my one worry was Churchill, for Winnie was a mad sod. Winnie, one run, then get the hell out of it. I'll be only seconds behind you and I don't want you cluttering up the field. Get in and get out, as far as Cape Town if you like. All went famously. We were in the right place at the right time and Bud Sutton was just clearing the field as we swept in from the north at about 300 knots. We were low too, down to 10 to 15 feet. At the far end, beyond the airfield's perimeter track, was a sports area with rugby goalposts. Beyond that, a road, and across that, appropriately enough, a cemetery. I was just about to lift over the goalposts when four corsairs appeared over the cemetery well spread out, low and fast and coming straight at us. Churchill. How on earth we missed each other I shall never know. At a collision speed of 600 knots you have no time to think, worry or dodge. Certainly you have no time to hope. The audience loved it. They thought it marvellous, and so well-timed. You crazy man, I said to Winnie when I had torn him off a strip. You'll do that once too often. Neither of us knew how prophetic that was. The ship sent down to us a couple of Frank's flying suits. They were the most amazing contraptions, both in appearance and construction, but there was no doubt that their concept was brilliant. When a fast-flying aircraft is pulled sharply out of a dive, or if flying in the horizontal plane, pulled into a steep turn, 
Both it and its pilot are subjected to increasing forces of gravity. When the sharp turn or drastic pullout comes, the tendency is for the blood in the human body to rush downwards because of sheer centrifugal force, in other words, towards the outside of the turn. Blood from the head and upper parts of the body rushes to the legs and lower parts. Furthermore, the weight of the body increases in direct proportion to the number of G-forces imposed. A pilot's first intimation of the oncoming force of G is a greying out of vision and hearing ability. An increased application of G produces blackout. Vision goes completely, the sense of hearing is reduced still further, and the weight of arms, legs and thighs becomes uncannily and incredibly increased. It becomes impossible to lift one's hands from throttle lever or joystick, or one's feet from the rudder pedals, yet one can still fly and is reasonably conscious. The next stage is complete unconsciousness. Probably nature takes over then to provide its own remedy by relaxing the pilot's tensions and thereby allowing the aircraft to emerge, even though slightly to a less acute turning arc. This Frank's flying suit was designed to postpone the moment of blackout which hits every pilot subjected to six or six and a half times the force of G. The effective force varies according to the individual, but generally between those two points. The suit encased the abdomen and legs into an almost unbearably tight pair of trousers, which, of double thickness gabardine, held an enclosed bladder containing two gallons of water. As the force of G caused the blood to try to rush to the thighs and legs, this great amount of water rushed downwards before the blood could get around to it and held the blood vessels of the lower part of the body to their normal dimensions. It exerted sufficient pressure to prevent their dilation, thereby ensuring that the blood remained in the upper part of the body. I rigged myself out in this complicated outfit one morning, under the eye of Commander, Operations, at whose orders I was to carry out these tests. My Corsair had been specially equipped with an accelerometer which would show me precisely what forces of gravity I would be imposing. I flew well out into Table Bay and carried out some pretty hair-raising dives and high-speed turns at over 300 knots. Our resident chance vort engineer had expressed an opinion that a force of 9G would cause the Corsair's wings and fuselage to part company, a viewpoint which, naturally, deterred me from trying to pull to 10G. However, there was no point in half doing the job, and I found that I could go to 8G without the slightest suggestion of even a grey out. At 8G the effect was comical, if one is capable of seeing the funny side. The cheeks of my face were drawn downwards to give a grotesque appearance which I didn't recognise as the thing I was accustomed to scraping daily with a razor. My ears were elongated to something approaching a spaniel's. I had at that time a small partial upper denture. This was forced down onto my tongue with such power that it was impossible for me to budge it. The whole of my body was plunged down into the seat with a devastating force, and my arms and legs, now eight times their normal weight, were utterly immovable. But I didn't black out. When we eventually rejoined the carrier, more experiments were carried out by all of us. The suit, however, despite the fact that it achieved its purpose, was never put into general use for we felt that, where deck landing was concerned, it was more of a hindrance than a help. In spite of sophisticated instrumentation, a pilot still derived enormous help and comfort from the seat of his pants. The sensations transmitted from the aircraft through his rear end told him a lot before his instruments could. That confounded bladder, which caused the pilot to sit on a small lake instead of the hard base to which he was accustomed, was his undoing. The seat of his pants was no longer there to help him. I have given some account of the blotting of copybooks here and there. It was towards the end of our sojourn at the Cape that I blotted my own. It appears that one Minheer van Riebeck founded a victualling station at Cape Town for the Dutch East India Company as far back as 1652, and South Africa has treated the date of his arrival in that wonderful bay as a public holiday ever since. So, on the 292nd anniversary, I gave a day's leave to three parts of the squadron. With nothing else in the world to do, and if only to give myself an appetite for lunch, I agreed with P.O. Vincent to test-fly my machine, on which he had just replaced the propeller oil seal. It was a day made for flying. Cape Province basked in the morning sunshine and all was well with the world, and with me.
As I headed for home, I found myself passing over Retreat, the rural area where Nick Lowe lived. He was a wealthy boar who owned a beautiful estate, handed down through his family from the early 18th century, where he grew vines, made wine and bred hunters. Fanny Ford and I had spent a weekend there with him a week or two back, when he had complained that he had seen nothing of these wonderful aircraft we had at Wingfield. This seemed to be as good a time as any to rectify that omission. I had no difficulty in finding his house, and there, standing by the side of the swimming pool, was Nick himself waving madly. Still full of zest and the joy of living, I treated him to his own private low-flying display, rounding off with a sequence of aerobatics. My exuberance was short-lived. When I landed, our new commander, Operations, John Smallwood, awaited me, with puffs of steam rising from his collar. I tried a bit of straight-faced flannelling, but John was too clever for that, and in no time at all I was standing before Captain Farker, whom I had known earlier in the war at St. Merrin, regrettably only slightly, for he was an affable and most gentlemanly soul. It must be said that we were having trouble getting used to John Smallwood's ways. Obviously, as a new broom, he felt constrained to sweep clean. His manipulation of the broom seemed a little energetic after Terence Shaw's gentle approach to life. What was more, mutual understanding hadn't been particularly encouraged when, after an interesting lunchtime session, Johnny Hastings, possibly with a view to participating in the next Olympic Games, had seen fit to throw a plank at him, to the accompaniment of rousing cheers. The fact that he missed was neither here nor there. Still, I couldn't blame John for carpeting me. He had no alternative, for he was taking his instructions from no less than the Chief of Staff of C&C &C South Atlantic, to whom my low-flying jolly had been reported by General I.P. de Villiers, GOC All Forces in the Union of South Africa. The complaint was that whilst I had been busy flying through Nick Lowe's back garden, I had been giving similar treatment to the General's. This was no doubt true, although it must be said that, if the General's house was where Johnny Smallwood said it was, I had at least been very careful not to hit it. The heat was on. It was to be a court-martial and nothing less. The captain, therefore, was obliged to confine me to the station, but he generously staved off John's demand that my wine bill should also be stopped. The days wore on. Rumour had it that the court-martial had already been named, and that the hearing was only a matter of days away. Smallwood said that I should lose no time in finding myself a prisoner's friend. I could see myself behind bars already and didn't enjoy the sensation. However, I had to get on with it. The best person I could think of was Ian Sorrell, whom I felt sure could be relied upon to say nice things about me. I rang him up in Durban. He called me a lot of extremely rude names, but asked me to let him know as soon as I had further information. He would hold himself in readiness to come. I felt depressed and very angry with myself. On the other hand, I hadn't killed anyone, nor had I damaged any property. I tried to believe that nothing too drastic could happen to me. On the following evening, I was sitting alone at the wardroom bar. All the lads had long since flown to the bright lights of Cape Town. I was taking it very gently, sipping like an old lady, when the captain came in. He gave me a cheery good evening, Hanson, insisted on refilling my glass and took a neighbouring bar stool. A bad business, this, Hanson, very bad, and I don't like the way things are going. What does Captain Lamber think about it? When he hears about it, sir, he'll be madder than hell, and I won't blame him for that. Captain Farquhar put down his drink and stared at me. Do you mean you haven't told him? No, I haven't. I don't know the drill for this sort of thing and thought that you or Smallwood would have reported it to Illustrious. Heavens above! And I had been thinking all along that you would have been in touch with them. I must get on to this right away. We haven't a moment to lose. He knocked back his drink and ran. It must have been the best part of an hour before he returned. He was smiling, a good sign, I thought. I think there's an even chance we might just scrape you out of this. I managed to get a telex through to your captain, and here's his reply. I can't show all of it to you. He folded the paper and handed it to me. But you may read the last two lines. What it said was, Above all, tell Hans not to worry. Everything will be all right.
I was overjoyed. We had had no time at all as yet to get to know our new captain, but there were indications that he could turn out to be as fine a man as his predecessor. At any rate, he wasn't going to have me thrown to the wolves. I'll see you tomorrow. The captain was off. We drove down to Cape Town at 1100 on the following day. On the way, the captain put me wise. It's all right. It's as good as over. Captain Lamb suggested the course of action. There was no point in trying to tell staff to run away and forget it. They are hell-bent on giving you the works. It seems that the South African boys have been doing quite a lot of nuisance low-flying recently, and a decision had been taken that the next case would be made into a stormer. You happen to be that case. Instead, he told me to see the general. I came down early and had a long chat with him. As I, and Captain Lamber, thought, the crux of the whole thing is that the general doesn't realise fully what a naval court-martial can do to you. You could lose your squadron and your half-stripe, and you could be returned to UK, more or less in disgrace, to spend the rest of the war stooging. A complete waste of a man who can do better things. When I told him this, he was appalled. All he wanted was that your backside should be kicked, and it looks as though this is what you will escape with. He has, in any case, assured me that he will not give evidence at the court-martial. We reached GHQ. Admiral Burnett, a sea dog with a large red face who could have eaten me as a second course, made very short work of me. There wasn't a lot left of me as I made my way out. My hand was on the doorknob when he said, Just one thing, Hanson. He was speaking more quietly now, and there was the suspicion of a grin on that large red face. Next time you go low flying, please be a good chap and take the trouble to find out who lives next door. Save us all a lot of trouble. They're all just big, bouncing boys at heart. I then thanked the captain for all he had done for me. You're not finished yet. You owe the general an apology. After all, he's the one to whom you really owe your escape. So we went along to the general. I went in alone. General de Villiers was a great man. He was of the same vintage as Smuts, and had served with him in the Boer War, leading his own commando against the British. He was a great gentleman as well as a great soldier. Come and sit down, my boy. Would you like a drink, eh? Thank you, sir, but it's a bit early. Really? I understood you navy chaps drank at any time. Then we talked about it. I tried to tell him that low flying was our job and our life, but I didn't pursue it. It was evident that he thought all flying machines were unsure things. I was more than a little touched because, despite the fact that my misdemeanour had caused him no little concern, he had been more worried about my own personal safety than anything else. He was marvellous, and we parted the best of friends. When I emerged at length, I took a deep breath and told the captain I felt a new man. He just grinned and drove me back to the station. I celebrated my acquittal by going to a film in Cape Town with five or six friends. Later, we dropped into our regular nightclub for a sandwich and a beer. We hadn't been there long before the club hostess, Sophie, drifted across to greet us. She was a cheery soul and readily sat down to accept a drink. After two or three more, she declared herself to be in the mood and surveyed the faces around the table with a look of confident expectancy. Now Sophie was about thirty-five and a fine mountain of a woman, of enormous proportions. I would have said that Sophie was on a loser from the start. She wasn't just fat. The blubber hung from her in folds, and was scarcely restrained by a black evening gown which bulged ominously and terrifyingly from neck to ankle. There was a silence of utter disbelief, broken only when one of our young doctors spoke up. What you need, Sophie, in that condition is a good doctor to give you the once-over. Where's the examination room? Sophie stood up without a word, and they disappeared. She had a flat on the top floor. Doc reappeared some time later. He resumed his seat and started in on another half-pint of beer. Remarkable woman, Sophie, he said. Wonderfully manoeuvrable for someone of her displacement. Handles really quite well at all revs. We were lost in admiration. Thanks to some excellent organisation by Steve Starkey, we threw a party for the squadron at the Kelvin Grove. It was a night for the ratings to sit back and enjoy themselves, with the officers taking care of the chores. They had managed to muster an incredible number of females, 
and the amount of food and drink consumed was staggering. Everybody had a thoroughly good evening. Later, not unexpectedly, some of the kids took decisive steps to develop acquaintances they had made during the party. Evan Baxter, one of our new pilots, seemed to have proved himself a worthy successor to Ken Boddington and Dickie Cork in the field of womanising, and had a track record which left Casanova very much in the amateur class, with L-plates back and front and egg on his face. He had found himself a pretty little number at the party, and had danced with her for the entire evening. With true hospitality, he was invited to spend the night with her. He needed no second invitation. In order to be back aboard the ship, now returned to us from Durban, he asked the girl to set an alarm for 0700. They beat the alarm to the drawer and pressed the button before all hell was let loose. Evan kissed his girlfriend. See you tonight at seven? And made for the bedroom door. His hand was on the handle. Don't make a noise going through there. You have to cross Mother's room to get out. She wouldn't mind at all, but it's too early to wake her. Bax was made of stern stuff, and his experience was infinite, despite his tender years and cherubic face. His various campaigns had been fraught with similar difficulties. He went into his drill. Off came his shoes, the laces were tied together, and the whole affair slung round his neck. He was off. By the faint morning light filtering through the curtains, he could see the exit door on the far side of Mama's room. When he reached it, he hesitated. Must just have a look at Ma before I go. Her fair hair was strewn seductively over the pillow. Beside it, a gentle wheeze issuing from its open mouth reclined the happy face of one of his Kiwi chums. Evan was at his side like a shot. Come on, you snoring man. Thirty-five minutes is all that's left between you and the rattle. Get a jerk on. Father, it seemed, had been captured at Tobruk and was now languishing in some lousy Italian POW camp. Mother just had to have her creature comforts. As Neil Brinaldson would have said, war can be crueler. As I said, Illustrious had now come back for us. She was ploughing through heavy seas around the Cape when, at 0800 on October 13th, we took off from Wingfield to have our first look at her for two months. The weather was glorious, with an azure sky and not a cloud to be seen, although the white horses out on the open sea gave us a pretty good idea of what the Roaring Forties were up to again. We renewed acquaintance with our shipmates by flying the air group in a spectacular tight formation over the ship. Our 36 fighters were in six columns of six, flying in line astern. They looked marvellous, and their accurate drill was a pleasure to see. As we crossed the ship from stern to bow, I was lucky enough to spot a greyish-white plume falling in a windswept arc from Bud Sutton's aircraft, leading one of the columns. Bud! You're losing all your oil! Get down quick! More luck was to come, and efficiency. The ship was heading into the teeth of a half-gale. She must have heard my urgent RT call, for I saw a batsman running down to his position on the flight deck. Bud, too, behaved with admirable promptitude. He didn't question my call, but fell out of formation like a stone, at the same time confirming to the ship that he was coming in for an emergency landing. He made the deck safely and was taxiing forward when his engine packed in completely. The main oil union, from the supply system to the engine, the engine's aorta, if you like, had parted, and Bud had made it in the nick of time. Whether or not my good fortune in spotting the leak had been instrumental in saving Bud's life, I don't know. If it had, I fear it was all in vain, for our great Canadian chum was to die in any event within four months. We flew back to Wingfield, had lunch and refuelled. In mid-afternoon we returned to Illustrious, now round to False Bay, and landed on. The wind was so fierce that she had to reduce to six knots, just sufficient to give her steerage way, while we had to turn into the deck when abreast of the bows instead of the stern, which was our usual pattern. We docked in Cape Town at 1700 and loaded our squadron ratings, bags and baggage and spares during that evening. Now there were four of us. Soon after we left Cape Town en route for Ceylon, the weather worsened and our Met officer, Norman Schooley Jenkins, began to look thoughtful. It seemed that a typhoon lay ahead of us, astride the equator. Its position was foxing, 
for he couldn't decide whether it would turn out to be a north or a south. They have different patterns, according to which side of the equator they occur. We spent two days and nights trying to dodge it, but it won in the end, and on October 26th it hit us with all the force of nature gone stark, staring mad. It continued to hammer us for three days, and I have no desire to experience another. Everything about it was terrifying. The sky, for one thing, was a dull yellow blanket that covered us from one horizon to the other. The wind, we had 115 knots blowing down the flight deck. The seas, from my cabin, down aft, near the stern of the ship, the waves could be heard hitting the bows like the blows of a sledgehammer. The ship's speed was pulled down to the minimum, just sufficient to keep her head into wind. We crawled along and took fearful punishment. The sailors up in the forepart were sick in their hundreds, and as no one could possibly survive on the weather decks, a breath of fresh air was out of the question. Our deck park of fourteen aircraft required continual vigilance, and sailors were held by lifelines as they moved gingerly from the island onto the deck to fix and check extra lashings. The wind was actually turning the propellers of these aircraft, and that against the compression of eighteen cylinders. Everyone had to use the starboard passage to reach the island, and to stand on the compass platform was an awesome experience. Outside was a mad, mad world of elements gone crazy, where the noise of the wind was that of the endless, high-pitched whistle of a steam locomotive. On the evening of the third day, the sky began to clear. Next morning we had sunshine, although the sea still retained its gigantic, terrifying swell. Two off-duty petty officers, sitting on the forward round down in the agreeable sunshine after being so depressingly cooped up in the bowels of the ship, were swept away by a gigantic wave of fifty or sixty feet. One was never seen again. The other one, luckier, fetched up in the forward starboard gun turrets with broken ribs and limbs. By the next day we were flying again, and once more making good progress towards Ceylon, which, after another short call at Adu Atoll, we reached on November 1st. As we sailed into China Bay, we found the battleships King George V and Howe lying at anchor, and what an imposing spectacle they made. We refuelled and sailed again in the afternoon. Illustrious was sailing for Colombo, and as she rounded the southern coast of the island, my squadron flew off to land at an RAF station at Kogala, near Gala, there to learn fighter bombing. It was a wild spot. Dense jungle covered the whole area apart from the clearings which accommodated the station. About half a mile inland was a large lagoon, on which reposed a squadron of Sunderland flying boats. The jungle, which came right up to the doors of the huts, harboured everything that flew or crawled, and the lagoon was the home of countless crocodiles of the extra-large variety. A very homely spot. There was one runway strip which stretched from the lagoon to the sea. The RAF squadron had no aircraft other than their big boats, so we were fortunate to have the exclusive use of the runway. Around the airstrip stood a collection of basha huts which housed the personnel.